Cannabis is a topic that polarizes like no other. Some glorify it, while others demonize it. Some say it's medicine, others say it's the gateway into addiction. In some US states, it can be legally bought in government-controlled stores. And in other US states, getting caught with small amounts will put you behind bars. How can the public opinion and laws on the same plan be so different within the same country? In order to understand why cannabis is such a controversial and polarizing topic, we have to first understand how we got here. Let's find out after the intro. Cannabis is one of the most widely used psychoactive substances worldwide. As of 2021, there are more than 200 million regular cannabis users worldwide. Asia being the region with the greatest number of cannabis users at more than 20 million regular users. Cannabis use varies by country and region due to the disparity in laws governing the sale and use of the drug. Some countries and regions continue to penalize the sale and use of cannabis, while others have decriminalized it and more recently completely legalized it for recreational use. The cannabis plant has been used for religious, medicinal, industrial and recreational purposes for millennia. Hemp fiber was used to make paper, rope and sailcloth, allowing European powers to expand their colonial empires, where they discovered that the plant's psychoactive and medicinal properties were also widely used. Anyhow. The term marijuana did not appear with regularity until the first two decades of the 20th century. To begin with, cannabis was introduced to North America as a common hemp plant in the 17th century. But judgment on the plant's medicinal and intoxicating properties did not fully emerge in the United States until the mid-19th century. There was a massive debate on the classification of cannabis as a potential dangerous substance. When and how did the cannabis stigma start? The cannabis stigma dates back to the 19th century, when it was first commonly used as a recreational substance in some of Mexico's most marginal areas. Marijuana was introduced to the United States Western states by the Mexicans and to New Orleans by Indians around and after 1900, in a time when middle-class Americans had come to fear both narcotics and ethnic minorities. During the early 1900s, hemp became an excuse to search and deport Mexican immigrants. As a result, the word marijuana replaced cannabis as a way to directly associate the plant with the Mexican population. In 1929, Harry Anslinger became the first commissioner of the United States Federal Bureau of Narcotics, who became a powerful anti-marijuana voice. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics is a predecessor of today's Drug Enforcement Administration. Marijuana was not classed as a dangerous, highly addictive drug, unlike opium and heroin. But as the political climate changed, Harry Anslinger took on the case of making marijuana illegal due to the claims that marijuana was allegedly a gateway drug. Despite the protests on marijuana's low likelihood of becoming an addictive habit, domestic production of hemp for industrial and commercial use was sharply curtailed after the passage of the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. The Marijuana Tax Act classified marijuana as a narcotic along with cocaine and opium, making it illegal to possess, grow or distribute the drug without first registering with the federal authorities and paying a stamp tax. Although medical marijuana wasn't technically illegal, it was still impossible to get and the only way to obtain it was through a costly fee system. Anslinger's anti-marijuana propaganda consisted of racist slurs and misinformation to situate marijuana as the nation's allegedly most dangerous drug. This campaign attempted to create a narcotic scare among Americans, leading to restrictions and criminalization of marijuana in several states. He created the image of a typical marijuana user, and among those users were Mexicans crossing the border, black jazz musicians, and other marginalized minorities. The film Reefa Madness was Anslinger's way of cultivating a message and striking fear among marijuana users with no real evidence. This campaign particularly targeted the communities of color and continued for the next 30 years of his career. After this propaganda was all over the news, he went on and took his message globally. Police officers in Texas claimed that marijuana incited violent crimes and aroused a lust for blood and allegedly gave its users superhuman strength. Rumors spread that Mexicans were distributing this killer weed to unsuspecting American schoolchildren. Fear of Mexican immigrants who used the plants was a driving factor for cannabis prohibition in western states. Fear of African Americans and jazz musicians using cannabis to take advantage of white women was prevalent in the eastern states. Making marijuana illegal was essentially a tool for racist politicians to outlaw and lock up migrants. 
However, cannabis doesn't cause superhuman strength, bloodlust or any other accusations. In fact, the US Drug Enforcement Administration fact sheet on the drug says that no death from an overdose of marijuana had ever occurred. It is crucial to understand that the prohibition of alcohol took place at the same time. Today it is unthinkable that alcohol was illegal. But that's exactly what was the case between 1920 and 1933 in the USA. Cannabis was much more than medicine and a recreational substance at this time. Industrial hemp was on the rise and threatened the paper and cotton industry. While there is no viable evidence, many still believe that lobbyists from the paper and cotton industry were a driving factor for the federal hemp farming prohibition later in 1937. A lot changed in the 1940s. Even during World War II, Anslinger stubbornly clung to his racially constructed insistence that less educated soldiers from broken homes made up the majority of drug users and addicts in the military. Government reports defied this notion, as well-educated soldiers who had finished their studies also used drugs. Due to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, America became directly involved in the Second World War. Hemp quickly came to prominence as an unlikely war material. There was even a saying among the US military that without cannabis the war couldn't be waged. Hemp cultivation was still banned in the US, thus it had to be imported from overseas, predominantly from the Philippines. When the US's hemp supply from the Philippines was cut off due to the Japanese invasion, there was a scarcity of hemp in the United States. Due to its importance in the military for products like rope and twine, the US Department of Agriculture launched a campaign to promote domestic hemp production as a patriotic act to aid the war efforts. The United States government temporarily lifted the ban on hemp cultivation and even encouraged farmers to grow more hemp by producing the propaganda movie Hemp for Victory in 1942. The film was part of a Washington PR blitz to get Americans hooked on the benefits of hemp that showed its history, how the plant is grown and how it's processed into rope, cloth, cordage and other products necessary for the war. The promotional campaign was effective. With seeds provided by the USDA, domestic production of hemp fiber and seeds reached a peak of more than 100 150 million pounds per year. This was in comparison to a pre-war level of 1 million pounds and was followed by a return to a low level of about 3 million pounds immediately following the war. When World War II ended, cultivating hemp was made illegal again in the United States and the US Department of Agriculture even denied that they or any other government body produced their pro-cannabis movie Hemp for Victory. This was obviously a lie as copies of the movie were found and are now available to watch all over the internet. The 1960s. The hippie movement began in the 1960s around college campuses in the United States and has since spread to other countries such as Canada and the United Kingdom. The hippies were the largest social movement of remembered history. Unlike the activist counterparts known as Yippies or Youth International Party, hippies were often not directly engaged in politics. Despite the fact that the movement arose in part in opposition to US involvement in the Vietnam War that began in November 1955. Later in the mid 1960s, a growing belief that marijuana use was both pleasurable and harmless had led to its widespread popularity among a young demographic. As a result, many of these white middle-class folks found themselves in court facing harsh marijuana-related sentences. For that reason, there was a significant outpouring of support for repealing marijuana sentencing laws. When Richard Nixon became president in 1969, public opinion on the Vietnam War was bitterly divided. However, most of the public shared the view that drugs were evil. As a result, the public officials blamed heroin and cannabis for the US Army's failures abroad. The 1970s In 1970, the Controlled Substances Act effectively banned the production of all cannabis, including industrial hemp. When Congress passed the Controlled Substances Act, it created a series of schedules classifying drugs by the dangers they supposedly posed. Marijuana was placed on Schedule 1, the category for harmful drugs with no medicinal use. According to the Controlled Substance Act, cocaine was classified as less dangerous and medicinally more useful than marijuana. As we know through scientific research, this couldn't be further from the truth. Regardless, federal law still classifies cannabis as a Schedule 1 drug, even though cannabis is legally available for recreational use in many US states. In June 1971, President Nixon declared the war on drugs. He dramatically increased federal drug control agencies size and presence and pushed through measures such as mandatory sentencing and no-knock warrants. The following year, the Schaffer Commission anonymously recommended decriminalizing the possession and distribution of marijuana for personal use. The commission's recommendation did not amount to proposing the full legalization of marijuana and favors criminal penalties only for the sale of the drug. 
Nixon requested a report from the Schaffer Commission that blurred the line between marijuana and hard drugs. The commission was in charge of researching drug abuse and marijuana use in the United States, as well as the physical and psychological effects of marijuana, and conducting a thorough investigation into drug abuse's causes and relative importance. The commission found no mental or physical abnormalities linked to marijuana, no valid stereotypes to draw conclusions from, and no proof of marijuana as a gateway drug. Despite the fact that its findings did not justify marijuana's continued Schedule 1 status, the Schaffer Commission remained silent on the subject of rescheduling. The 1980s The presidency of Ronald Reagan in 1981 marked the start of a long period of skyrocketing rates of incarceration, primarily due to its unprecedented expansion on the drug war. The number of people behind bars for nonviolent drug laws offenses increased from 50,000 in 1980 to over 400,000 by 1997. Ronald Reagan was set on a full-fledged war on drugs after a period of moderation under the Carter administration. Reagan's approach resembled Nixon's in some ways. Reagan took advantage of Nixon's southern strategy and the racial issues surrounding it. Reagan made a clear distinction between his administration's drug policy, specifically on marijuana, early in his presidency. He ensured that the government would effectively combat drugs. His wife, Nancy Reagan, began a highly publicized anti-drug campaign, coining the slogan, Just Say No, which set the stage for the zero-tolerance policies implemented mid to late 1980. It was a way of supposedly educating young Americans about the dangers of drugs and drug abuse. Her idea was to show the nation's youth that even though the drug influence is powerful, young people could resist the urge and simply say no. Anyhow, the program's critics say that the message had little impact on the war on drugs, but they most certainly are one major root cause for misinformation about cannabis to this day. A later amendment to the Anti-Drug Abuse Act established a three-strike and you're out policy, requiring life sentences for repeat drug offenders and providing for the death penalty for drug kingpins, the 1990s. Fortunately, in 1996, medical marijuana was legalized by the state government of California. California voters passed Proposition 215, allowing for the sale and medical use of marijuana for patients with AIDS, cancer and other severe and painful diseases. This law stands in tension with federal laws prohibiting the possession of marijuana. Patient medical access laws began to get adopted in the 1990s. This time was far more comprehensive, establishing allowances for the use, possession and supply of THC products for qualifying patients and their caregivers or providers. At the federal level, the cultivation, distribution and use of marijuana have remained federal offenses. When states began to legalize it, first for medical and then for recreational use, enforcement became more complicated because states enforced their own narcotic status. This caused a conflict between the federal and state governments. What was illegal at the federal level was now legal in some places at the state level. The 2000s As marijuana became more mainstream and viewed as less harmful than it was seen during the Reagan administration, the states that paved the way for medical marijuana began allowing it for recreational purposes. Since late 2014, Congress has approved a rider to the annual Justice Department Appropriations Bill that the funds may not be used to interfere with the implementation of state medical marijuana laws. On June 21, 2019, the House of Representatives approved a similar amendment that would also prevent interference with state legal adult use marijuana businesses. The legislation was also put forth to make state legal marijuana activities legal under federal law. Between 2014 and 2015, the Obama administration signed the Farm Bill into law, allowing research institutions to start piloting hemp farming programs and ease some restrictions on cannabis research to study its potential as medicine. Meanwhile, various bills have been introduced in Congress to reclassify federal scheduling of marijuana, reducing or eliminating penalties for minor marijuana violations and legalized medical marijuana nationally. Despite numerous obstacles, the Drug Policy Alliance pushed through monumental drug policy reforms in the 2020 election. In a historical victory and possibly the most significant blow to the drug war yet, Oregon voters approved Measure 110, the nation's first decriminalization measure. It confirmed a substantial shift in favor of treating drug use with health service rather than criminalization. All across the country, in liberal states and conservative ones, people made their voices heard. And they said loud and clear that it was time to end the war on drugs. As of 2021, 19 states in the US have fully legalized the use of marijuana, medically and recreationally. Unfortunately, cannabis is still illegal in most countries and research on the positive effects of marijuana use are still not acknowledged in most countries. 
vast parts of the global population still believe in incorrect facts spread by misinformation campaigns. Government bodies worldwide that still haven't legalized marijuana should also recognize the positive potentials of legalizing medical and recreational marijuana. It will boost the economy by billions of dollars, create hundreds of thousands of jobs, free up scarce police resources, empty the pockets of organized crime and terrorist organizations, protect consumers from dirty cannabis, and put an end to the substantial racial disparities in marijuana enforcement. Are there any other cannabis-related topics that you would like us to make a video about? Let us know in the comments down below. If you want to dive deeper into this topic, you can head over to weed-smart.com and read the full article. Do you enjoy factual and informative cannabis content? If so, consider subscribing to this channel so you can watch our upcoming videos and learn more about cannabis. If you want, if you want the algorithm to understand that you enjoyed watching this video, then leave a like and a comment. See you in the next video.